Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and this is the first episode of my own podcast, The Idiot, and I am your host, Ritvik Siraguri. This whole series will consist of me talking about art in general, from paintings to all the way to movies. I'm a person who loves art and also a person who has a lot of opinions. I see that so very explicitly as the more I'm involving myself in music, literature, and some very good plays and movies, I'm noticing that intuitively, everything that happens in this world runs in contradictions. When a person provides his lucidity and sees the drawbacks within his emanations, he tries to stop himself and remain silent. This person has no opinions of his own, and in that way can be seen externally as an idiot, a person who knows absolutely nothing. This person that I've described is someone I wish to become, a person who's always absorbing information, becoming the biggest fool in the world. What I would like to do in this podcast is for me to just talk about art and my thoughts about it and just share it all with you folks out here. Today, we will be talking about the movie Pride and Prejudice. Now, I know this is an adaptation of the book and there was also a TV show on this. I do intend to get myself involved in both of them, but now I would like to discuss the story of this show, the characters, and some things I took away when watching this movie. Darcy, one of the main characters, was very quick in judging the female center of this movie, Elizabeth. Elizabeth was also very quick in judging his character. Both are prideful of one's own self and dislike the idea of being criticized or looked down upon. I would also like the idea onto the degree where the girl Elizabeth also tries to make opinions of her own when her interlocutors don't provide substantial evidence to provide their narrative or point. This leads to her having quite a few biases to the people around her. One such bias was the fact that Dar- Darcy is a prideful and self-centered prick. And when the character Wickham expresses his disdain towards Darcy, she just takes it upon his word as she already thinks very low of Darcy as mentioned earlier. Moreover, she isn't even interested in finding any evidence to see if Wickham was if what Wickham was saying is even true. Now, her sister Jane, on the other hand, is probably, in my opinion, the most mature one, if you ask me. She understood that love is a lot more than just amassing wealth. It involves the idea of being able to express oneself freely without the fear of being judged and being criticized upon. This is very evident in her relationship with Mr. Bingley. They both don't really have much in common other than a few things, such as their huge likeness in spending time in the outside rather than using it to read books or learning something new. Maybe there are more, as I haven't read the book, but that's besides my point. They both feel comfortable with each other. There's clearly a good sense of compatibility between the two. One such example is when Jane gets sick and Bingley was more than willing to let her stay in her house, in his house, and never considered it to be a form of burden in his shoulders or a pain in some way. He didn't think that there may be any alternatives of a sickness being present. Well, honestly, we do know that is the case. Her parents purposefully put that plot in there. <laughs> but even Jane does the same too, altogether. All When Bingley just vanishes from Netherfield to London, we do see her grieve in the end. She moves on but wishes for him to be happy. Yes, there may have been some form of dismay she had towards him, never talking to her properly about his sudden disappearance, his letter not providing any substantial explanation to his departure. But in the end, she wishes for him to be happy. That's the beautiful part of this relationship. Both being understanding that both of them are individuals capable of making their own conscious decisions. Hence, it makes this relationship less possessive. The relationship is not where the individual's actions to certain events match to their expectations. This is not the case where the person whom you are in a relationship has become an object in some way. That if you do this and if I push you here, you do this and hence I will be happy because you responded to what I thought you would do. No. 
This relationship is where the existence of the other entity's happiness and well-being is proportional to your own happiness. Even if that means that they choose to break away from you or go away from you, marry someone else, but as long as they are happy, you are too. Now coming back to Elizabeth and Darcy, we see both of them extol these very idealistic points of view on life and love. Many times it just so happens that they are at odds with one another. For example, Elizabeth thinks that poetry is stupid and breaks love away. But Darcy, quoting Shakespeare, says that poetry is the food of love, is it not? Now, this is not just one instance where they have these collisions in opinions. It happens on numerous occasions. Another instance is how quick Darcy was to judge Elizabeth's family and her sister for using Bingley and Jane's relationship as a method to raise up the social class and increase their social standings. He said that this was the reason why I separated my friend from you and chose that their relationship was not perfect. Yet you see, his judgment was very quick and rash. He was never able to see that the fact that Jane's nature was very shy and distant. And when Elizabeth mentions this to him and says the fact that she doesn't even open herself up to her very sisters, to her own very sisters, we see that Darcy realizes that he is at fault and even apologizes for his actions. Now here's the whole problem of an idealized life, guarded upon rules. It makes you susceptible to be closed-minded and hence sometimes making your actions inexcusable. What I really like about Darcy is the fact that he's more than willing to take responsibility for his mishaps. He doesn't shy away from it or go away from it by saying that it was not his intention, I was sticking with my ideals, so I am not wrong and hence I will not bear any of these consequences. The moment, the moment he realized he, what he has done was wrong and was based on his lack of knowledge, he took it upon himself to fix things because he was the one responsible for breaking the relationship th the two had to begin with. It was in this particular event you see both of them grow as characters. We see that they both now understand each other on one primal concept. Each do actions based on their understandings that has been presented to them and hence their intentions are good. Making them both be very good people. The very notion that Darcy did this to help his friend showcase that he is a selfless individual. We cannot take that away from this man. We also see how Elizabeth understands Darcy po Darcy's point of view as she reads his letter that he had sent to her. This is why this whole arc is very important for the characters, as the main thing in relationships is just good communication, expressing yourself, you know, telling whatever is there in your mind, to the other person, you know, just, just letting that all be there and be told. I really, really love this movie. The whole plot revolved around how pride can lead to prejudices, which becomes a roadblock to communication and hence making the relationship get worse off. Maybe that's why it's called pride and prejudice after all. <laughs> Thank you all for listening to today's episode. Hope you have a great day and stay tuned for what lies ahead. Thank you.